the root without water will separate the soapy gel from the fibers and the gel is applied as glue. Other plants that make soap are species of yucca, like yucca whiplay, whose root and leaves produce soap, The leaves and the vines of the buffalo gourd plant, which is common across the southwest. and also the nuts of the California buckeye tree, which only produce a light lather, yet work very well as a fish stupefier. Here is a list of soap making plants around the world so you can continue to research them on your own. Here we have a very popular and useful wild plant, curly dock, or Rumex crispus. There are many species of Rumex growing along creek beds and streams all over the world, all with very similar uses. So once again, it shouldn't be very hard to find. In the medicinal category, dock's most popular use is as a stinging nettle remedy. The fresh leaves are crushed and the juices are squeezed over the sting site in an effort to relieve the pain. In the utility category, the roots of some species of Rumex are so high in tannic acids that a strong decoction is made from the root, which is then used to tan animal hides. Like most species of Rumex, in the edible category, the fresh young leaves are edible and even contain more vitamin C than oranges and more vitamin A than carrots. The mature seeds are also used as a grain and separated from their chaff then readily processed in a flour. Which brings us to our next processing lesson, harvesting wild grains and turning them into baking flour in the wild. Here's a tip. Any hard edible seed or nut can be ground into flour and processing does not vary greatly from grain to grain. Step one is working to separate the seed from the chaff. With dock, 
Each seed is attached to a small brittle leaflet, which is rubbed away without crushing the seed. From there, as with all grains, the chaff is winnowed away. Winnowing is the process of exposing your seed and chaff pile to a light breeze, even one from your mouth, which blows the lighter chaff away and leaves the heavier seed behind. Though native peoples use flat baskets for this purpose, in the field you will use a t-shirt or a bandana. Once the chaff is mostly gone, the seed is ready for grinding. In our case, we are using a matate, or more commonly known as a mortar and pestle left behind by Native Americans. Of course, this will not always be available, so the seeds can also be ground between two flat stones. A wind block must be established with this method, however, or your grain will blow away once powdered. Now, Simply work the seed until it is powdered like flour. Okay, now you can put it, I'll zoom out and you can put it in the bag. A very popular way to consume flour in the field is to make it into the legendary ash cake. Simply mix the flour with water until you have a doughy consistency. Then shape your flour into a small burger-like patty. The cake. This cake is then laid directly on hot coals where it is cooked until solid. Remember to only place your cake on the coals and to keep your coals separate from open flame as seen here. For more on cooking in the field, simply view our DVD, The Complete Guide to Making and Using Fire, where the detailed methods for primitive cooking are covered in full. Here we have the mighty oak tree. There are many species of oak all across the world, all with the same uses to those living off the land. The oak tree takes many forms, from the majestic white oaks of the valley with its archetypal leaf, to the shrub-like coastal oak with its holly-like leaves. The bark and acorns of the oak are high in tannic acid, which is why it has been used to tan animal hides throughout history. Its dense hard wood is also wonderful for building materials and for firewood. In the medicinal category, a mild decoction made from the bark or acorns is high in tannic acid, which is great for skin conditions as well as skin reddening burns just like those from the sun. Now for the edible category and our next processing lesson. Though oaks may differ widely in size and shape, they all produce acorns. And after processing, acorns are highly edible. As noted in previous lessons, tannic acid is the same acid in coffee that makes it brown and bitter. Acorns are very high in this acid and it must be removed before the acorn is edible. And just like coffee, the acorn is leached with water. So first, here's how to do it in the field the same way Native Americans have done for thousands of years. First, attempt to gather mature acorns as they just start to brown on the tree. If that is not possible, downed acorns can be gathered as long as they are not black or moldy. Acorns are best prepared along a creek or stream as they require a lot of water to process. After gathering your acorns, you must deshell them.
Step one is to dig a pit in the sand large enough to accommodate your acorns. You will be pouring water through your pit, so you may need to disturb the sand at the bottom so the water flows through readily. Now, line your sandy pit with grass or leaves so that the acorn does not come into contact with the sand. Now, lay your acorns in the pit and begin to fill the pit with water, allowing it to drain through the sand. You will repeat this process as many times as needed until you taste the acorn and all the bitterness is removed. When fully prepared, the acorn is quite bland. An alternative method for leaching acorns is to simply boil the acorn in several changes of water until the boiled water stops turning dark brown and the acorns are no longer bitter. A simple way for the beginner to enjoy acorns at their home is to use a coffee maker. Simply put the acorns where the coffee normally goes and allow clean hot water to pass over the acorns several times until, once again, the water that passes through the acorns no longer turns dark brown and the bitterness is removed. Acorns can be quite simple to prepare and very tasty to enjoy. They are high in fats and carbohydrates and even contain some protein and minerals. They were a staple food of Native Americans and make a great snack at home. Here we have a very striking plant, the wild rose. Though it is the California wild rose pictured here, wild roses like these grow all over the world. Most wild roses seem to enjoy moist meadows and creek sides. Though their flowers greatly vary from the cultivated versions, the rest of the plant is nearly identical. In the edible category, the hip is the most useful part. These hips are high in vitamin C and can be eaten whole or even made into a delicious tea. The hips are even made into jams, jellies, and delicious wines. In the medicinal category, the vitamin C bearing hips are often made into a tea to boost the immune system and fight off colds and flus. You may also see the hips powdered and applied to lotions and different cosmetics to improve the health of skin. In the utility category, the long flexible branches can come in quite handy. The spiky thorns are easily removed and the branches are quite simple to straighten. Their flexible yet hard wood makes them great for arrow shafts, hand drill fire makers, as well as atlatl throwing darts. Also, the branches contain a pith in the center which is easily hollowed out which made them popular amongst Native Americans as pipe stems. So you see, the rose is not only a beautiful plant, but a very useful one.
Here is a plant that is not only commonly found in creek beds around the world, but also the produce section of supermarkets and even gourmet restaurants. This plant is watercress. Watercress is a very popular salad green and pot herb and is high in a wide range of vitamins and minerals including iron, calcium, B vitamins, magnesium, and vitamin C amongst other nutrients. Watercress has a very peppery flavor, so it is great for flavoring stews and in salad is best mixed with other greens. Though watercress's primary use is in the edible category, it is said eating watercress promotes overall health and well-being and has even been used as a remedy for scurvy, which is simply a lack of vitamin C, and is even being touted today as a cancer fighter. Watercress grows directly in the stream or creek, so if you wish to eat it fresh, be sure you pick that which is above the water line to avoid any type of waterborne bacteria, viruses, cysts, or poisoning. Flavor to our uh, steamed foodstuffs. As you can see, it grows in large runs, easy to gather, very nutritious, great flavoring, which will help reduce the need for seasoning. Okay. Since we are talking about popular salad greens, here is another that grows all across the world, spedwell. In this case, we are showing water spedwell, but different species of spedwell grow across hillsides and streams all across the world. Like the rest of the Veronica species, it is highly edible as a raw salad green and is said to be high in vitamins and minerals, especially vitamin C. Spedwell is also a popular medicinal remedy. It has historically been used as a concoction for chest colds, flus, and similar type complaints. Spedwell. It gets this common name from its high vitamin C content and would be eaten to recover from sicknesses and illnesses quicker. This will be great for our steam pit. As you can see, it's another plant that grows in large runs and is easy to gather. Once again, quite nutritious. Now for something to give your soups and salads a little bit of flavor, wild celery. Appium graviolens is the same species of celery found in your local supermarket. However, wild celery is found to be much more stringy and is thought to be better cooked than eaten raw. The seed of wild celery is also edible is said to contain calcium and is used exactly like celery seed in the store. Surprising to many, in the utility category, 
The essential oil of celery is used in mainstream perfume production. Since we have just gone over wild celery, it is only appropriate to cover one of its poisonous lookalikes, the infamous poisonous hemlock. Hemlock is by far the most well known of deadly plants, being the poison of legend administered to Socrates to carry out his death sentence for corrupting the youth of Athens. Take time to observe this plant carefully. Note the trademark purple blotches on the stem. Look carefully at the fern-like leaves. Pay special attention to the unique white flower. It is important to know toxic plants just as intimately as useful ones, lest you become a victim of their toxins. Now we will run footage of the plant and be sure to take note of all its features. Now let us move on to another toxic plant, the infamous poison oak. Simply brushing against poison oak will cause what's referred to as contact dermatitis, or simply a rash caused by coming into contact with a skin irritating chemical. Poison oak leaves are covered in a skin irritating oil. The oil on poison oak is the same skin irritating oil on poison ivy and sumac. It is said that 75% of the world's population is allergic to this oil, which is why most will get the rash, yet some can come into contact with it as much as they'd like and never have a problem. Should you come into contact with poison oak, ivy, or sumac, it is recommended to wash the area thoroughly within two hours of contact with cold water and a strong oil cutting soap. There are many specialty soaps for removing the oils on the market and even barrier creams. We strongly suggest you research them should you be going into an area where these plants exist. Poison oak grows in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. The leaves can be anywhere from the size of a finger to the size of a whole hand. It can grow in small shrub-like patches or even in 20 foot tall vines. What makes poison oak easy to identify is, of course, its oak-shaped leaf. These leaves grow in bunches of three on a single stem and are often accompanied by small white berries. These berries are just as toxic as the rest of the plant and you should avoid contact. We will now run footage of the plant, so take note of its features very carefully.
Before You Now is one of the most powerful medicinal plants we will cover in this series. Whorehound. Whorehound can be found growing anywhere from grassy fields to abandoned city lots all across the globe, and is often considered a weed. Though you may be familiar with whorehound candies, it has one of the most unpleasant flavors you will ever come across. It is very hard to drink, yet if you can get it down, its effects will be strong and noticeable. The extract of the whorehound was put into candies simply to mask its unpleasant flavor. Whorehound was historically used for colds and flus and any kind of lung infections or conditions. It was even used as a quinine substitute. Whorehound is often used as an expectorant and the fresh leaves are even crushed with water and applied to swollen joints and wounds. Now for our next processing lesson, preparing the medicinal poultice. A poultice is simply the external application of herbs to an injury or wound site. To prepare a poultice, gather your plant material and crush it into a paste-like mixture with water or alcohol. After your herb is sufficiently crushed, apply it to the wound site. After application, you will cover the area with some sort of bandage, rag, or other material. Allow the paste-like mixture to stay on until dry, at which point it will be removed and, if you would like, new herbs put on fresh. Whorehound contains very powerful active chemicals and should be treated with respect. Use it in moderation, harvest it, and cure it carefully, and Whorehound will surely treat you right.